wait. Hmm? Wait a sec. So last time we had 50 people, all the people were interested on COVID uh, and what is... <laughs> we have, now there are online a lot, a lot of uh, series, no? A lot of, uh, and that is um, confusing. Yeah. Submit. Are you also transmitting online on the YouTube or? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, good. Yes. So the people can join. Yeah. People that ask me yeah. that we are doing something else. Uh -huh. Yeah, because many people prefer to see at YouTube yeah. than to watch yeah. here. Yeah. We are transmitting now, so you are online. Maybe we can start. I can start just a, a brief, uh, uh, okay, a brief uh, um, introduction, and so you can start. So first of all, um, thank you to the virtual series of complexity. This is the second appointment, and I thank, of course, the speakers to be here and all of you to be with us this afternoon. Uh, the panel of this series is full till December, but uh, new proposals are welcome for 2021. On the web page of the series, you can find the announcement of the seminars of October. Um, two weeks ago, we talked about uh, COVID-19 from two different perspectives with uh, Andrea Crisanti and uh, Yamir Moreno. And if you are interested to watch again uh, these videos and these seminars, uh, please, uh, you can find on, the, on our channel. Uh, the next seminar will be 6th of October and uh, we will have uh, Stefan Turner from Medical University of Vienna, Austria, and Florian Kim from uh, Cambridge University and Imperial College of London. I give you some uh, very few technical information before starting. Each seminar will be about 40, 45 minutes, and the discussion, since the two speakers have different topics, will be at the end of each seminar. But if you want to interrupt, please, uh, there is no problem, uh, write down uh, uh, your questions and uh, I will read them for, um, for you. Uh, so everybody can post uh, questions uh, on the chat and I will read. We are recording the seminars uh, and now we are live on YouTube and uh, um, I think that's it. That's the, the topic today are different. We have uh, two uh, outstanding speakers, uh, talks. Our first seminar will be held by Francisco Rodriguez. Uh, Francisco, I have to admit people. Uh, Francisco um, is, belongs to the complex system and that works uh, at the Institute of Mathematics and Computer Science, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, he published more than 100 scientific articles in international journals, including uh, uh, Physical Review X, Climate Dynamics, and Natural Ecology, uh, so not only physics, but also something related to ecology. His research is focused on complex networks, uh, epidemic models, uh, and a lot of other stuff, the system biology, ecology, climate dynamics, uh, and so on. 
Uh, please, now I give you the stage. Okay, can I start? Okay. Okay, thank you for the for the opportunity to present our last results. So today I'm going to talk about uh, predicting epidemic process and synchronization in complex networks. So the idea is, given that you have a complex network, how you can predict the evolution of the dynamical process from the network structure. So basically I'll talk about synchronization, what is synchronization and how you use synchronization to model different process. I'll talk about a spreading, and then I will show how you can use statistical inference and machine learning to predict, predict these two dynamical processes from the network structure. And at the end of my presentation, I will discuss some ideas and some challenges that you still need to study to understand better uh, the structure and dynamics of complex systems. So initially, what is a complex network? The complex network is a graph in which you have a set of nodes connected by edges. So you have examples of complex networks in the Facebook when you have users connected by friendship. We have complex networks at the internet where you have routers connected by optical fiber, uh, scientific collaboration, protein interactions, airport lines, and the web. So you have networks everywhere. And the idea is, given that you have a system uh, with elements that interact then we can represent the system as a graph. So we have a set of nodes, and these nodes are connected by edges, okay? Uh, basically, you can say that a complex network is the skeleton of a complex system. So if you have a complex system, the structure of the complex system is represented by a complex network. For example, you have our society, then we have people. These people are connected by friendship or familiar ties, and uh, we can simulate different process on this network, like epidemic spread, spreading or cooperation or any kind of process. So you have different types of, of, of dynamical process that you can simulate in complex networks. For example, you can simulate synchronization. We have synchronization in your brain. Uh, for example, you have uh, some movement of my hand, for example, some parts of my brain is synchronized. We have epidemic spreading. Uh, spreading of virus and information or any kind of information. We have the spreading of rumor, like in the Twitter or Facebook. We have cascade failures in which you have a system in which some parts of the system will fail. So you have the propagation of this failure to the whole system. Uh, we have cooperation, opinion dynamics. So you have many different dynamical process. So given that you have the system, the organization of the system, the idea is to analyze how the structure of the system influences dynamical process. In the case of synchronization, this is a really important uh, phenomenon. So in synchronization, we have synchronization among fireflies, uh, among power transmission in, in, in power grids, uh, synchronization among lasers and neuro. So you have synchronization everywhere. And the idea is to construct some model in which you can understand this dynamical system by uh, verifying, for example, how the interaction between the elements will induce the emergence of the collective behavior. To study synchronization, the most popular model is the Kuramoto model. In the Kuramoto model here, we have, this is the evolution of the phase of oscillator I, so we can, Imagine that this oscillator is a kind of a panel. So this is the phase, okay? So the evolution depends on its natural frequency, depends on the interaction between uh, the oscillators. For example, this term is one, if I is connected to J, and also you assume that the interaction occurs according to difference of the sign of the difference between the phases, okay? And also you have one important term here, that is the coupling. So as a stronger the coupling, the easier the synchronization. So when you increase the coupling between oscillators, we have the emergence of synchronization. So here, for example, when the coupling, coupling is closer to zero, we have no synchronization. The oscillators are more or less independent. When we increase 
the coupling, we can see the emergence of clusters of synchronous oscillator. So, but this emergence occurs only after a given threshold. And you can show that this threshold depends on the network structure. So this is the average number of connections. And this is the second moment of uh, the distribution of the number of connections. So you call this the degree. So this is the second moment of the degree distribution. So as more heterogeneous is the network, the easier the synchronization because this is be, will be very small, okay? So you, what, what you observe in the system is, if we increase the coupling, we have no synchronization. The synchronization occurs only after this coupling, okay? And some works verified, for example, that this coupling is related to some uh, mental disorders. So depending on the structure of the brain, it is easier for the brain to synchronize, for example. Uh, so many works verified that the influence of uh, network structure of synchronization. For example, we published this report, this review of physical reports in 2016, and then you show uh, different approaches to address this influence between the structure of the network on the dynamical process. Another important dynamical process is epidemic spreading. Uh, we have a spreading of bacteria, virus, uh, computer virus, for example, ideas and also fake news. So use the same approach to model all these different spreading process, okay? So you have the spreading of different kinds of information, but the models are more or less the same. In the case of diseases, we had different uh, outbreaks. For example, you have the outbreak in Athens before Christy, we have the Spanish flu, and today you have the coronavirus. So you have different outbreaks and the Propagation of the disease depends on the network structure. For example, for example, just for comparison, here you have the propagation of the bubonic plague in the Middle Age. If you take a look on this map, uh, it starts here in Turkey in 1347, and to reach Norway and Sweden, it took about four years. So the disease started, and but the propagation was very slow in the in Europe. Just for comparison, if you compare with the pandemic flu you had in 2009, the disease started in Mexico and after three months, you can see that it started in March and May, it arrived in all the continents. So what changed is not the uh, capacity of propagation of the virus, but what changed here is the network of connections. So the structure of the network plays a fundamental role on the spreading process. Okay, and the idea is try to understand how this structure will influence the propagation. So to study epidemic models, we have some compartments. So for example, you assume that each node in the network, so you have our network, we have a set of nodes. So each node will be susceptible or you'll be infected or you'll be recovered, okay? In this case, we have the SIR model. So one individual is health, this individual will become infected and then will become recovered. This individual will be immune to the disease. Or other option is we have the individual is susceptible. This individual will become infected and will become infected again. This is another model, this is the SIS. And this is the case in which you have a disease in which it's not possible to acquire immunity, okay? Following these compartments, we can have different models, okay? So you have different models and these models are adapted to each type of disease. So depending on the disease, this model is enough or we have models that are much more sophisticated. Initially, the epidemic models were developed for fully connected graphs. And this is easier to, this is very easy to address because if you have two nodes, I and J here, and we change, I and J, we can see that the patterns of connections do not change. So the patterns is the same. So you have a set of equations and uh, we have one equation for each node. So this is really easy because we have just one equation, okay? We don't have uh, one equation for each node, for example. Uh, then this model were later adapted for the case in which you have a regular number of connections. So you have a regular graph, but in your society, we can see that we do not have a so regular structure. What you have in your society is a kind of parallel degree distribution. This is called scale-free networks. 
Scaling from networks, if you calculate the distribution of the number of connections, we, we see something like this, okay? So this implies that most of the nodes are not very connected, but we have a very small fraction of nodes that are densely connected. These co densely connected nodes are the hubs, and these hubs play a fundamental role on the spreading process. So you can verify that scale free networks are everywhere, are in your society, are in your brain, are in among uh, ecological networks, protein networks. So in many networks, we have a parallel degree distribution. So we, say, we, we can say that the spreading process depends on the network structure, but how is this dependence, okay? So to address this idea, in 2001, what proposed, uh, what was adopted, the, the models to networks. In this case, we have the SIS model. So what we have here is the fraction of nodes with degree key evolves according to this equation. So this is the fraction of susceptible nodes. This is uh, this term here represents the interaction between a susceptible node with degree key and one infected node. And then from this, we have uh, the rate in which new nodes are infected, and this is the recovery rate, okay? So, so nodes are being infected, but are recovered from, from the disease according to the rate mu. If you perform a first order approximation on this equation, then we will arrive in this equation. This equation is very easy to solve because the solution is just the exponential term. And from the exponential term, we can calculate the characteristic time. And from this time, we have that this characteristic time is larger than zero because it's, time cannot be negative. Then this term is also larger than zero because this is larger than zero. Then we calculate that this critical rate for the propagation of the disease. So the propagation will occur only after reaching this threshold. So it depends on the second moment of the degree distribution and also on the average degree. So again, we have a phase transition. So if we increase the, the probability of infection or the rate in which new nodes are infected, we do not see the emergence of the disease. We see the emergence all of the disease only after this critical threshold. This is related to the R0 in epidemics uh, as we see in many uh, different papers, okay? So after reaching this term, we have no epidemics. So we have a kind of observing phase. And after this value, we have the active phase in which you have the epidemics propagating in our society. Another approach to address this epidemic process is by using a Markov chain approach. In this case, we have the, the probability that node i will be infected and time t plus one depends on this node is not infected and will become infected or is infected and will not recover or is infected, will recover and become infected again, okay? So this term here defines the probability that the node will be infected and is related to this term here. And this is the probability that I is connected to J, okay? So depending on this probability, we have that the infection will be transmitted from J to I. So by performing, uh, before uh, we have here the, the types of connections, so you can have a kind of contact process. A contact process will have just one transmission per time unit, or you have the reactive process in which in each step, uh, infected node will try to infect all its neighbors, okay? So you perform here again, a first order approximation and including the term here in this equation. So you have the stationary state here and by solving, we will have this equation. And this is the equation is the eigenvalue equation. And again, by solving, we have that the critical probability for the transmission depends on the second moment of the degree distribution and also on the average degree. What, what you can see here is that following a different approach, we get the same results, okay? So here we have a comparison of the evolution of the disease for a random network and a scale free network. And you can see that in scale free network, the probability, the minimal probability for the transmission is closer to zero because this term here will tend to infinity for 
scale free networks, okay? If this parameter gamma is between two and three, we have that the transmission will be, uh, will be very easy. So that's because today in your society, it's very easy to propagate the disease from one place to another one, because when the disease reach some hub, the disease will propagate very fast, okay? Uh, to perform the simulation, we have two different process. So you have the reactive process in which each node tries to infect all its neighbors, or you have the contact process in which you have just one connection per, per step. But we can also formulate the continuous time process. And in this case, we have a Poisson process associated to each connection and also to each node. And then by performing this uh, type of algorithm, we have the Gillespie algorithm. And the Gillespie algorithm uh, per permits that we address uh, the time to be a continuous variable, and then we have the set of different equations, and this is a good way to perform an approximation. So there are many different approaches to address epidemic process in networks. We have, for example, mean field, as you just said here, Markov chain, quenched mean field, pair approximation, individual based mean field. So many different approaches, and following different approaches, we can get very similar results, and following different approaches, we can verify how the structure of networks is influencing the propagation of the infectious agent, okay? So given that we know that the structure influences the epidemic process, how this occur? This is a good question. For example, given that we have some triangles in the network, or you have hubs, or you have hubs connected to low degree nodes, how these patterns of connections influences the emergence of the fraction of infected or the number of infected people. So this is a good question because it's really important to know because if you understand how this structure is influencing the dynamical process, then we can control the structure, we can change the structure to control the dynamical process. So this is really important mainly for power grids. For example, we can try to avoid blackouts by changing the connections between power stations. In your brain, we can try to understand mental disorders by verifying how a health subject, how the brain of a health subject is organized and how people present some disorder like zoophrenia, how this change the brain of a given subject. And also in the case of epidemic spreading because we can adopt some methods to try to avoid the propagation of the infections agent as we have today by using mask or by using vaccination or different types of approaches. So uh, to try to understand how the network structure influences the dynamical process, we have two different frameworks. We can study this by using statistical inference or you can perform the prediction. In the case of the inference, the goal is to understand how the variables are related to the output. So you want to explain the data we have. In the case of prediction, the goal is to predict the outcome. We're not interested in understand the model. We have a kind of black box and we just want to predict as better as possible. So based on the data we have predicted new data. Also, we can perform the analysis in two different levels. We can try to understand the whole network. For example, given that the, is, the spreading is occurring in a given country, how this is spreading will affect the whole country. Or we can analyze in the local level. For example, given that one individual is infected, how many people will become infected after a long, a, in the long run, okay? So given that I am infected, how many people will be infected if I start the disease? So this is the idea. So in the global level or hypothesis, is it possible to predict the variables associated to dynamical process? So the idea is, given that you have the network, we say that the dynamical process is a function of the network, okay? So it's a function of the network. Then if you understand the topology of network, we can try to understand the dynamical process. So our approach is based on the learning model. So you want to learn, uh, to train a model to learn about uh, the, the relation between the structure and dynamics, and then we try to predict other dynamics from the structure. But this function here, it's really complicated because it includes, for example, 
non-trivial patterns of connections because the networks are scale-free networks. We have no linear effects because one node infect another one and the infect come, come back. We have correlation between variables. So this is really, really complicated. And to perform the analysis, we, we needed to generate the data set. Uh, to generate the data set, we needed to generate networks with different configurations. For example, we can generate random graphs. In random graphs are networks in which the connections are included at random without any rule. We have scale-free networks in which you have the presence of hubs here. We have smaller networks that are regular networks in which you put some perturbation. So what you, what you can do is to generate networks with different patterns of connections because these patterns of connections will uh, permit the model to learn about how these patterns are, is influencing the output. From these networks, we generate for these models, we generate 50 networks for each model. And to describe the network topology, we consider several different measures, OK? So we consider, for example, the average information, number of articulating points, second moment of the distribution. So we consider many different measures. And then uh, in the case of synchronization, you assume here that this is the order parameter. The order parameter is that one that suffers the phase transition. This is R. And here we have a regression model. And by using a Bayesian approach, we verified that this measure is the most important one. So this measure is the typical distance between pairs of oscillators. So if you wanted to increase the, 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 the synchronization, we needed to decrease the distance because of this, this term is negative, okay? So if you wanted to improve the synchronization between oscillators, what you have to do is decrease the distance between them. So if you have, for example, a power grid and you want to improve the synchronization between the power transmissions, what you have to do is include or rewind some, some links in order to decrease the distance between them and then we can improve the synchronization. In the case of epidemics, the idea is the same, but in this case, you assume a beta regression because uh, we, we are modeling the, the output variable is the, out, uh, the number or the fraction of infected nodes. So this is the outbreak size. So this is the fraction of people that will be infected. And then uh, by performing the regression, we verified that this measure is the most important. This is the average search information. This is the most important for epidemic spreading and also for rumor spreading. And what is this measure? The average, the average session information is the, we can say that this is the average number of questions like yes or no, we ask it to go from one node to another node in the network. For example, if I start here and I want to arrive here, I have to ask, for example, I go to here, to here or to here, I go to here. From here, go to here, yes or no, to here. So as, as we, we if, if, you, if you make a lot of questions, so it implies that this network is not easy to navigate. So the smaller this coefficient, the easier is the navigation in the network. So you can see that here, the contribution is negative. So if you have a network in, in which it's very easy to navigate, so in this network is very easy to propagate the disease. So what you verified is our society is becoming more and more connected. So the information is very easy to navigate in social networks, for example, and also in your society. So because of this, it's very easy to transmit one infectious agent in a given, uh, in a given country, in a given city because of this, okay? So this is the prediction. So you have here is the observed variables this from simulation. This is the predict predicted values. We can see that we have a very good correlation. And here is missing some points because we could not uh, generate all possible topologies that are possible, okay? So, but if you generate more topologies, maybe we, we will be able to, uh, to put some observations here. But the most important here is to see that we have a very good tendency, okay? So you can see that uh, the prediction is, is very good in this case. Uh, in the local level, so 
Initially, we performed the prediction for global level. So now let's study the local level. The local level, it's important to identify the super spreaders. For example, you know that in the case of coronavirus, some people spread much more the disease than other ones. So the idea is how can we identify these super spreaders from the network structure? So again, the idea is given that you have a node, so we structure several measures from, for this node, and you want to predict how many people I will infect after some time. For example, I started the disease, how many people are we infected? So again, we, we assume a learning model, but this case is more complicated than in the large scale network because now if you remove this node here, for example, we break the connections between these four nodes. So what you can see here is that the observations are not independent. So if the observations are not independent, then we are not able to use traditional statistics, okay? Because the statistics assume that our observations are EIID, or that is identical, distributed, and independent. So in the case of epidemics, we wanted to predict the outbreak size starting in each node. And in the case of synchronization, we wanted to predict if one oscillator will synchronize or will not synchronize. So our solution, instead of using traditional statistics, is to use machine learning. So the idea is we remove part of the networks, the set of nodes, and you use this part of networks of this network to train the model. So you train the model in part of the network and then we will try to predict it in the whole network. It's the same as if you have uh, the, the virus spreading a given city, we will see part of the city only and try to predict how the disease will spread to the whole city, okay? So we we'll, we'll perform this analysis for epidemic spreading and synchronization. So to perform it, uh, the supervised learning process, we needed the data, we, have, we needed the hypothesis space, that is the function that you are assuming here, or hypothesis, and also you need a loss function. So to gener generate the data, we generate a given network. From each node, we extracted some measures. For example, this is the number of connections. These are centrality index. We extracted many different centrality index. So for example, you have a node that is central, then this node can propagate the, the information easily to all the other nodes. And this is our output. So output will be the average outbreak size in the case of epidemic spreading, or you'll be one if your oscillator I is synchronous tasks here, one is regression and another one is classification. To evaluate this function here, it's this function F, it's really uh, difficult to evaluate by using statistical methods because of the dependence between the observations. So you have used uh, random forest and neural networks. In the case of neural networks, the input here will be the my uh, attributes for each node, for example, the degree, this is the fraction of triangles, this is a kind of uh, central measure. Uh, here is the output, this can be, for example, the outbreak size or uh, is one if, net, if he, a node will be synchronized. And then by adjusting the weights here, by using, for example, the gradient descent method, we can train a network and then you use this network to predict it on the other nodes, okay? In the case of random forest, what you have is we have our data set, we extract samples, changing the observations and also the variables. For, from each sample, we construct a tree and you use these trees to arrive in a kind of majority voting and following this rule, we arrive in the prediction, okay? Uh, our data set is divided. Part of the network is used in the training set, part of the network in the testing set. The training set is used to learn the model. So you adjust the model and then you apply in the remainder of the nodes. To perform the model selection, we use keyfold cross validation. So you select one part of the training set to test, to, to validate the model, the reminding of the nodes to train the model. And here is the prediction. So you have here the data we generated. This is the prediction. And you can see that you can get a very good tendency here. So the person correlation coefficient is closer to one, okay? So what to conclude here is that from the US transportation, network and also to social networks, 
we can predict the, the algebraic size from the natural structure, okay? And also we can verify which pattern of connection is the most important one. For example, we verified here the key core and the number of connection are the most important for the spreading process. And the key core is related, for example, if you have, we can say that the, the graph is like an onion, then you have uh, some layers here. To remove, we arrive the key core. Uh, if a node has a very large key core, it implies that this node is at the, the core. So in this case, we, we are able to identify the most influential spreaders. So this is really important because in this case, what you can do is identify which nodes are you perform the vaccination to try to control the disease spreading, okay? And in the case of synchronization, we use the same approach. And now I want you to predict if one oscillator will be synchronized or if the oscillator will not be synchronized. As, as you can see here, the area under the rock curve is about 0 0.8. So you can see that also using only the information about the structure of the network, but you use part of the network to train the algorithm, we can predict if one oscillator will synchronize or will not be synchronized. And also, if you uh, determine the measure importance, we can see that for small coupling, some local measures are the most important one. If you increase the coupling, so in increase the strength of connection between oscillators, we can see that some measures will be more important. So this is between the centrality is a, a, a measure in which is related to the load we have in each node. So it's more large scale network. So you can see here, if we increase the coupling, the, the pattern of connection more related to, to local pattern of connection, we will change it to more global one. So what you conclude from this is, if you have some information about the structure and, and dynamics of a given network, then we can predict the dynamics from the network structure. So you can extrapolate to the whole network and we can try to verify how this uh, outbreak or, or synchronization you will spread to the whole network and then we can try to perform the prediction, okay? So this, for example, you can apply in your case today in the coronavirus, because if you know how the, the virus is propagating, then what you can do is try to collect some measures. And then if you have these measures, the contact tracing between people, then you can try to extrapolate to the whole society, okay? But this is just a first investigation because this is the first uh, application of machine learning in to study dynamical process in complex networks, and you have many challenges. For example, in your case, we consider static networks, but we know that we have networks in which the contacts change with time, okay? So we have a kind of temporal networks. For example, you, we, are, we are with some people, but in the night we are with other people, so our contacts are changing. So this is one challenge that we have today. Another challenge is how information propagates from one network to another network. For example, here you have, for example, Twitter, and people are on Twitter and are in the Facebook. So for example, we have two different networks. And the question is how to model this kind of system and perform the prediction. So you have, for example, I can receive some information on Twitter. I can get this information from Twitter and propagate on Facebook. And also you have people moving by train by airplanes, by cars. So we have different levels. And the idea is to understand how this multi-layer organization is influencing the dynamical process. We also networks with noisy, noisy because uh, we don't have enough information in much of the times. Uh, we have heterogeneous dynamics in which, for example, you have everyone has a capacity of propagation and we have many different problems. And maybe we need a new statistics to address this problem on graphs. Because in statistics, we assume that the observations are independent. And when we are studying networks, we are not able to assume that this, this case, okay? So what you have to do is adjust most of the methods developed for statistics to networks. So this is a big challenge we have today, okay? Okay, so this is what I have to, to show today. And now I am open for 
questions. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. So the open questions, please. I can I can ask you starting now with the, okay. with the, the silence. So uh, I mean, what is your solution anyway for this um, for the now for pandemic for breakdown of COVID? So yeah, the best solution is contact tracing. Yeah, what what you have to do is is perform the contact tracing to understand how people are connected, and then try to infer how the disease will propagate if you just do nothing. Okay, if you just uh, uh, have a free uh, propagation scenario, how this will uh, occur, okay? So this is what you have to do. So one solution is contact tracing and also try to identify the super spreaders because if you can identify these super spreaders, we can vaccinate these people and then we can try to control the propagation. So there is no one other solution than try to understand how the social network is organized in order to try to control the propagation. Thank you. So there is a question from Francesca von Kloss. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. My question is about the train test split of the networks. I understand that nodes and the features are split into two sets as usually, but is the dynamically process running on the whole network or only on the train set subset of nodes? Yeah, it's, poss it's possible to do two different approaches. For example, we verify that if you train in the whole network and select just one part of the network to perform the prediction, it's very easy to, the, the algorithm can learn very well, but we can also simulate in just one part of the network because what we can do is we start in one node and then we will verify how the network is propagating. Then the, the disease is propagating. Then we stop the process and use this information to train the algorithm, okay? So this is the idea, is try to verify how the disease is propagating and use the only part of the information to try to extrapolate to the whole system. But depending on the network structure, we verified that it's easier to, to for example, one not expected point is, as more complex is the society, it's easier to predict because we need a lot of information. If you have a regular, a random graph or a regular graph, what you have is a kind, we have no, not so many information because it's more or less the same. But if you have a very complex system, a very heterogeneous uh, number of connections, we verify that these patterns of connections is really important. So as more complex is the society, it's easier to propagate. But in your case, yes, we have used only part of the network to perform the prediction. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So, waiting there are other questions. I have another curiosity, actually. I'm not okay. Sure that, but the curiosity. So you conclude that uh, maybe we need the new statistics. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, is that true? Or maybe you need just to try, you know, to track better the people. In one sense, you need some information. Yeah. Not to expect yeah. Yeah, but for example, when you perform the regression, is a very uh, traditional statistic method. When you perform the regression, you assume that observations are independent. Okay, in your case, for example, given that I am infected, I can infect you. So your infection depends if I am infected, depending on our contact. Okay, so for example, the observations are not independent because uh, if you remove some people this removal will influence the propagation and will influence the probability that someone will be infected. So this is what you have, because when you have statistics, if you change some, uh, some observations, do you not change the conclusions? In, mm -hmm. your, ca in your case, if you change the, the observations, you change the output. So this is complicated because you have a kind of feedback. Okay, so you have one connection between the training set, the, the, the independent variables and the dependent one. But if I change the, the output, I also change the first one. So you have a kind of connection. And because of this, maybe you need to adapt the methods we have for statistics today. So good challenge, nice challenge. Another question yeah. from Alessio Cardillo. 
Uh, if I understood correctly, both the training and the forecast are made using the stationary state of the dynamics. Is that right? Uh, uh, no, because we have considered the SIR model. So in SIR model, the dynamics will, will the, the stationary state will not have the stationary state. We have only the absorbing state. Okay. So the disease will propagate and after a given time, the disease is over. Okay. But in the stationary state is really complicated because uh, we know that in a Markov process, when you run the Markov process for a long time, we, we, the, the information about the source of the, the, the starting point will be lost. So this is the point. So we know how to do this only for uh, dynamics in which you don't have the stationary state. Okay? In, the, in the propagation of epidemics. In the synchronization, yes, you have the stationary state. Okay, let's see. Okay. Giorgino, Tony Giorgino, thanks for the talk. Did I understand correctly that the infection propagation is simulated with the Gillespie approach? Yeah, yeah, we have simulated two different approaches. For example, in the, in the first case from the room, we used the, the Markov chain approach, and the, the second one we have the Gillespie approach. Okay, so but the, there there's some difference, but it depends on the time step. For example, if I, I decrease the time step, is expected that two approaches will be not the same but uh, closer to each other. Alessandra, you also cost. I put your cost too. Yes, I know. I, I have seen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I also have uh, one small question uh, regarding okay. uh, the, the statistical part, because, uh, well, for example, in, uh, in uh, spatial statistics, uh, usually uh, the, the concept of uh, um, stationarity is uh, substituting the concept of identical distribution in a sample. And the concept of uh, ergodicity is uh, substituting the concept of uh, independence. I don't know if in, uh, in the application to net networks, uh, we have some similar uh, concept that can be developed maybe. I think we have lost the, <laughs> the speaker, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I don't, I frozen. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let me, wait, let's see my chat. Oh my gosh. That went um... <laughs> Okay. Are you back? No, is uh, okay. I hope it is able to back. Okay, can you see me? <laughs> my connection is <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> okay, can you can you please ask again? <laughs> yes. So I was asking if uh, in uh, in this theory of uh, networks, uh, uh, huh? some concepts like uh, uh, stationarity or ergodicity, which are used uh, for spatial spatially structured processes, uh, can be exploited uh, to in statistics. Yeah. Let's say. Uh -huh. Yeah. In, in the in the case of networks, also because, for example. What indeed what we do is, is uh, consider the network as a Markov chain. Okay, so you have, for example, the each node will be on the state, and then you have the transition between states. For example, you have the infection, uh, each node is a person, and uh, we have the transmission from one person to another one, and this will change the state of each node. And of course, ergodicity is important uh, in this case because. Uh, one important point here is this centrality uh, measures that I have shown you is related to this ergo city because if you if you have a network in which you have some absorbing states in which, for example, you, the, the disease moves to someone and these people is not connected, 
okay? It's not possible to transmit to other ones. Do you influence the dynamics? So usually what you do is you assume that our network has just one class, like a, a, a Markov chain, which you have just one class, and then we can arrive in a given stationary distribution. So mm -hmm. depending on the process, this is really important, mainly in the case of spreading dynamics. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have also another curiosity because today I read on Twitter, I know, and there was a paper just probably a, not a, not published yet. It was an archives. Uh -huh. uh, and they in this paper claimed that it's very important uh, what happened, you know, the small community, I mean, uh, families, you no, know, uh, because we we are close and we don't using or use or any face mask, any. Yeah. Sort of so how do you put this stuff in your uh, model? Because, okay, I understand very well this super spread, you know, is, uh, yeah. uh -huh. but in this context. Yeah, it's possible because in this case, what you can consider is that each node is a network. Okay. So for example, your house is a node in the network. So you have houses that are connected or places. And inside this, uh, this house, we have also a network. So what you have in this case is a metapopulation model in which you have some nodes are, are being connected. And this node, if this node is infected, we have a probability that this node will move to other place. So because of this, this, uh, this social distancing is really important because you, broke, you break the links between these uh, houses, for example. So because of this, it is one way to control, but the problem is to control the internal connection. So we have that this also play a fundamental role on the spreading dynamics. Yeah. Yes. Now in Munich, no, I'm in Munich, there is this problem uh -huh. with Oktoberfest because uh, mm. Oktoberfest is, uh, is, a pro is prohibited, is a closed, <laughs> but the people want to, and so they meet in a small group, but seems yeah. to super spread and uh, the numbers are increasing. Yeah, it's complicated. The natural then you, you need to break the network. This is the point. <laughs> yeah. Are other questions? Mm, I don't see anyone. So I want really to thank you so much. Okay, Very thank you. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, and now we change. We change to and we move to the second speaker. So we have Asaf Zaritsky. Uh, he comes from uh, the Department of Software and System Information Engineering at the Ben Gurion University and Nagev. We know each other for a long time. Uh, well, we spend a lot, lot of time in, uh, in Israel. His research is in computational cell dynamics and the interface of data science and cell biology. So we are moving to biology. So it's still uh, human. So something that is life, but for another point of view. Thank you so much to be here. Thanks a lot. Too. Thank you, Kate and Stefano, for inviting me. Uh, okay, so I'm wondering whether to start. So, so I was hoping that I'll have time to talk about uh, also a, a collective cell behavior at the end of my talk. And since we are 10 minutes early, I was thinking maybe I'll start with the end and then go to the beginning. And if people come uh, at times, they'll, they'll be able to hear the talk from the beginning, right? Sounds perfect, perfect. Okay, and uh, I'm, oh, one second, I didn't share my screen. So, uh, yeah, sorry. And and please, I mean, the, the talk is uh, it's computation, bio, cell biology, and, uh, and uh, maybe other things. Please feel free to interrupt and ask if something, if I don't describe it or not explain some terms or anything, please feel free to to stop me. Actually, I feel a little nervous when I'm talking 45 minutes in front of a, a screen without any intervention. So, <laughs> so this will be great, thanks. And now I can share my screen. Okay, and I'll go to the end. Oh no, I'll go to the, I'll start with the beginning and then I'll jump. Oops. One second. Oh, 
Okay. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to speak here. Uh, and I will talk about, uh, about uh, deep learning in the context of uh, metastatic uh, melanoma. Uh, but I'll start a little more broadly than that to, to, to tune in. So uh, for hundreds of years as a cell biologist, we look under the microscope and uh, stare at microscopic images and learn from what we see about uh, nature. And in the last uh, few tens of years, we understand that this is not enough and we need to put numbers in order to, to show and to convince that what we see is real, that it's not a, a subset of, of, of some artifact or something specific that we see in a, in a small uh, subset of cell. And we, we need to really quantify that. And for that, we have uh, many, many tools now that allow us to do the basic image analysis tasks of segmenting cells, tracking molecular events, measuring all kinds of measurements and doing a basic machine learning on that. And this in principle, it's not true completely entirely, but in principle, it allows us to, uh, to automate the process of, uh, of image analysis in microscopy images. And this is uh, necessarily, especially given the amount of data that are generated uh, today, so here are our numbers from a review already from 2017, giving a production rate of, uh, of uh, different uh, microscopy uh, techniques. Usually they don't generate, you don't use them uh, nonstop and generate uh, all that information at once, but, but, but this is the, the capacity of these techniques. Uh, so uh, you cannot hire any more uh, poor uh, PhD students or postdocs that they have to manually annotate the images and uh, track the cells. Uh, and we have these tools that can do that automatically. But I want to highlight that it's not, you don't need this uh, huge data sets, even in a simple uh, time-lapse of, uh, of uh, a cell doing something, there is a huge complexity of uh, molecular events and things that, that our eye can just do not, can, cannot interpret. And we need to put numbers in order to understand that. So there is a lot of, hidden patterns and information hidden in this type of uh, data. And I think something also interest, interesting if uh, there are computer scientists in the room that they were in most computer vision tasks, the challenge is to achieve the, the competency level of a human observer. So the ability to identify a person or to, to link a word to, to an image or all of these uh, tasks, the, the, the gold standard is the human uh, brain. In identifying patterns in complex cell imaging data, it's just we cannot cope with that. And we really need, I think that the computer can do the better, much better than humans. And I'll try to show you that uh, in a few examples uh, today. And the, the main example will be the, the melanoma project. So the idea is uh, to switch the order here. And instead of uh, looking at an image, coming with an hypothesis and then quantifying it, we can switch the order, start with quantifying, put in, putting numbers, finding patterns within these numbers, and then going back to the biology and, uh, and uh, interpreting what we, have, what, we, what we can learn from that. In order to do that properly, we need to, be, uh, to, to know what to look for, where to look for, what are the experimental possibility and how to do it. And this is the basically in, in data science, this is the domain knowledge. We need to know what to do and how to do it in order to get there. Okay, so my lab is uh, focused on, uh, I, I'm, I'm a relatively a new lab. I mean, uh, I'm in Ben Gurion University in uh, Beersheba in Israel at the south, southern part of the country. Um, I'm here for almost uh, two years now, and we have two main arms. Uh, one is uh, collective cell behavior or collective intelligence. Basically, it's uh, trying to bridge the scales between a single cell and a collective cell behavior. Uh, and I'll talk about it a, a little bit now. And most of my talk is going to be about the uh, interpretable machine learning. And I'm going to give you one specific example about uh, melanoma. So now I'm going to skip many, many slides to the end of my talk. Okay. 
and I'm going to talk for about uh, maybe five, 10 minutes about uh, the arm on collective intelligence in cellular systems. So basically the main question is how from single cells that each of them are independent, uh, in, in, in independent state, can make decisions based on the internal state and based on information that they receive from the environment, to get emergent properties of, uh, of uh, collective cell behavior. And the way that we, uh, 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 we tackle this uh, very general problem is uh, trying to bridge the gap between heterogeneous single cell behavior uh, to a collective uh, uh, phenomena. And basically we have uh, two uh, tools here. The, the first tool is looking at dynamics events at the uh, single cell level and trying to use time series of one cell to predict the, the time series of the other cell. And this will, uh, can give us an asymmetric measure for how one cell is influencing the other cell and vice versa. And once we do that uh, for all the cells, we can have a spatial network and we can start and uh, follow how information propagates from the local to the uh, global scale in uh, this system. I have a question. Can I stop for those seconds? Yeah, of course. I'm happy. Uh, in this okay. case, all the cells are the same. So you are considering the same cells, I mean, uh, a homogeneous population. Yeah, so the, in this case, in this what you see here are endothelial cells. I'll talk about this project in, in, in a few slides. Uh, they, are, they all come from the same genetic background, but they still, uh, they still show very heterogeneous behavior. Uh, some of them are in the, terms, in the, in the, the context of the communication, some of them are really a leader, some are followers, some are communication hubs that are good in, in, in receiving and transmitting information. Some are individuals, even those that they come from exactly the same genetic background. Uh, uh, Non-genetic heterogeneity is, is, is a thing, right? I mean, cells are different from one another for, for different reasons. Uh, and we can talk about it if you'd like. Uh, yeah, and, and the projects that I'm going to show here now are all about uh, non-genetic heterogeneity. So thanks, Kay, for highlighting that. We are moving also to more heterogeneous a, a genomically heterogeneous uh, system where, where cells come from different systems. So uh, in order to, uh, to build the tools to answer these big questions, we are jumping from one uh, system to another with uh, many collaborators in, in Israel and around the, the world. And each of them has a specific uh, by a question that we want to answer, but also it allows us to build the, tool to, uh, to, the tools to answer a, a more general question and to build a framework that can be applied to many different uh, other systems. And I'm going to very briefly talk about these three projects, which actually all came out or will come out uh, next week. I'm, I'm actually hoping to submit the, the, the manuscript uh, in the next few days, uh, in the last uh, month or so, maybe two months. So uh, when looking at the system of, uh, of how cells, here you see fibroblasts, within 3D microenvironments that communicate through the extracellular matrix, uh, uh, we can learn uh, how the cells are speaking mechanically to each other by how they, they form the, the substrate. Uh, and, and from that, we can learn how to, how to follow the information, the actual information is propagated from one cell to the other cell because we can, we can see the information propagate on the substrate. Uh, here in the middle, you see a project on collective uh, cell death or how death propagates a, 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 a long uh, population. And for us, this is a beautiful system because uh, the, the death starts somewhere. There is a, 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 an heterogeneous response to an external uh, stress signal. It starts somewhere and then it propagates. Then the, the cells next to it are more susceptible to die after the death wave starts somewhere. And uh, uh, when looking at the uh, networks or graphs, uh, this is a very fun uh, graph because it doesn't contain uh, cycles. Once a cell dead, it's dead, right? So this is an, a very simple uh, network to look at. And finally, here you can see collective calcium signaling to an external mechanical stress uh, that, is, uh, that, 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 that we follow the transition of a, sy of a system from an unsynchronized to a synchronized state. So I'm just going to quickly uh, show you a few cool movies and then I'm going to start my talk about uh, uh, melanoma. 
So the long-range cell-to-cell mechanical communication project is, uh, is led by Asaf Nahum, a very talented uh, master student who just graduated, uh, just uh, submitted his thesis uh, yesterday. And our collaborator is Alei Ayelet Lefman from the Mechanical Engineering uh, School at uh, Tel Aviv University. And what we see here are two fibroblast cells in 3D microenvironment that are communicating mechanically. And you can see the dense uh, a fibrin gel that is densi the, the, the densification of the fibrin gel over time that uh, implies uh, that we're looking at, uh, at the communication. What Asaf was able to do is to actually measure that and to characterize based on the fluctuations of the microenvironment of this white signal, which is the, the fibrin gel between the cells. And he could uh, uh, define a very specific fingerprint for each pair of cells that communicate. Actually, the right way to do that is even not to look, or I see that it stopped, is not even to look at where the, the fibers are more dense, but actually going a little bit up in the up or down in the Z plane. So here is a, a fun movie that, uh, that uh, shows what Asaf see as a computer. From looking at these fluctuations, we can match almost perfectly the communicating partner. And you can read the preprint for that. The second project is about uh, characterizing the propagation of uh, death from a local to a global scale. It was just published uh, last week. And uh, what you see here are uh, cells Oh man, that's where, yeah. What you can see here are cells uh, in a form of program cell death that is called ferroptosis, which is an iron dependent uh, form of cell death. The cells, the cells are treated here with the uh, nanoparticles of uh, iron. And what you can see here is that uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity. Some cells are very susceptible and do not die, while others are, are well, actually very few are very uh, sensitive and begin dying. And then why, why, once they commit suicide, they convince the cells next to them to die. The, the death here is actually the, the green uh, fluorescent signal that we, you see. It comes from the rupture of the, nuclei, of the nucleus and then the, 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 the signal comes, uh, comes out. And, and we define here a quantitative measures to, to characterize uh, image, image analysis and quantitative measures to characterize this uh, type of processes. The last project is with oh, and this is with uh, and this project was with uh, was led by Michael Rigman and uh, from the lab of Mike Overholzer from uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center. And the last project that we're going to very briefly uh, uh, mention today is a project that is led by uh, Amos Zamir, uh, the first uh, PhD student in my lab. And our collaborator is uh, Botsan from the physics department at Oregon State University. And what you see here are endothelial cells uh, that are in a microfluidic device and are experiencing a, a shear flow that is uh, very well, uh, very precisely controlled by, by both. And uh, what, what you, you, you cannot see here, but what I can tell you from the data is that the cells are synchronizing their calcium signal so over time, they are becoming more and more coordinated uh, across the system to the external signal. And what we do here, we define for each cell its role in a communication network, and we see how, how the information propagates from the local to the global scale. And we actually find that the cells are beginning to understand their local environment through time, and through time, uh, uh, they reinforce their roles in the communication network, so they have a memory. And, they, and this, this allows uh, the network to, to the, the information to flow in the network from the local to the global scale to eventually coordinate the system. Okay, so I think that's it about the collective cell behavior. So if you have any questions about that, then now is a good time. First of all, I want to congratulate. I think it's very ama it's amazing what you, sh what you are showing and very, very nice. I have a little question because I'm in this field, so I'm very curious. So I mean, uh, um, in other words, you, can you also change the behavior of these cells since you can predict in one sense what is going on? Can you also change the behavior? So can you predict? Uh, predict or change dynamically, you mean? I agree, I agree. So yeah, I, I'm thinking uh, predict and then maybe change, okay. Yeah, so we don't, I mean, it's the first, pro, in, in, for, specifically for here, it's the first, pro, right, it's the first project. We are now thinking about predicting, for example, 
the time of death based on the environment or uh, whether when when is the, a cell is going to turn to a communication hub because the cells are switching the roles but there is there is some order in that they're not switching randomly so most these cells maintain the role in the communication network and if they switch usually usually they switch to to roles that are more uh, uh, more better at communicating right they go from less to more communicating uh, states uh, uh, I don't have a specific idea of how to, to actively change the role of a cell in a communication network like, like here. What we are going to do in, 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 uh, in other experiments is to, to, to put here other cell types which we know are interfering with communication. These are gap junction mediated communication that interfere with this communication. I mean, we know that uh, when you put enough of them, the communication is, is, is the, the synchronization of the system is uh, decreasing. The question now is again to follow at what stage can we see local local regions of synchronization that are then lost because they encounter some you know someone that disrupts the communication. Just the last question, then I stop. Uh, how much how, how much is important the distance so for communicate? I mean, there are many different ways that the cells use to communicate. Yeah. So so okay. So it depends on the system. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll go up here a few slides. Okay, so it depends on the system. Uh, when we look at the, the cell ECM cell, the communication through the micro environment, uh, yeah, when you go far enough, you're not going to, to, to feel, right, the, the, the change that the other cell is, is, is actually applying on the, on the, on the uh, gel, right, on the, on the fibrous network, right? Uh, but it's it's longer than you would expect. It's it, it it goes to pretty large distances, and or maybe I don't know what you would expect, but it goes to really uh, long distances, and even small amounts of forces are enough for the other cell to to to. Uh, so even if you put uh, you know you put blebastatin, you inhibit the most of the contractility of the cell. The other cell can still can still feel that and 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 change its internal state to respond. To, to the, the signal that is propagating. You can see that uh, if you go closer, the cells are better at sensing, and if you go further, they are less, but it's not, it's not very uh, strong. When you look at the collective cell death, uh, we have uh, strong reasons to believe that the main uh, mechanisms here are based on, uh, on, uh, diffu on diffusion in the, just, you know, just in the environment. Uh, I do think that there is also, there might be also a role to to cell to cell contact, but uh, we, we still don't know that uh, in this system at least. Uh, yeah, so diffusion and yeah. And uh, for collective synchronization, I left the best for last. Uh, yeah, we can, we can actually measure that. We can see how the information propagates from the local to the global scale. And we can even see that uh, when you look at correlation, you'll see that the cells that are closer are, are always correlating better when you, I mean, there is a decrease when you go to further distances, even when the system is very synchronized. But if you look at measures of, uh, of, uh, of uh, causality analysis, right, information flow, predicting future values of one tier, series, time series from the other time series, you will see that it actually switches. So at the beginning, the cell is more, uh, is more uh, you see the information flow in a more uh, local scale, and as time goes by, and you're more coordinated, so there is not much information that your neighbors can transmit to you, right? I mean, you're pretty much synchronized. You can see that actually the influence goes to further distances. So if I'm even if, if I'm further enough from you know from I don't know Elon Musk to someone who has a lot of influence, I'm going to to to, to you know to, to get this information from this guy and and actually listen to to them. Thank you so much. There is a question from Silvia Bonfanti. What is the range of application of this method? Distance, the training is made on first neighbors? Uh, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I can understand exactly the question. Maybe we can ask Silvia. Maybe Silvia is here. She can, uh, I can give her. So, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, basically you just uh, partially replied. Just I wanted to know how did you, um, when you train your method, if you look at the first neighbor um, uh, 
um, cells or whether you also use, I don't know, second ring and third ring of uh, cells to train the, your, uh, your system. Okay, so when we look at, when we define the role of a cell in the communication network, yes. we look at the neighbor, at a neighborhood of, of a topological distance too, just yes. to have enough statistics to, to measure that, to measure the role, right? Yes. We have uh, one, we have one uh, figure in the manuscript, one panel in a figure in the manuscript that we actually look at, at, at growing topological distances. And then we correlate the topological distance to the probability of having a, an edge going to an, an information flow from one direction to another. So mostly we look at the local regions and we try to characterize the single cells and correlate that to the synchronization of the system. And we have one piece of result where we actually go gradually and show that correlation switches from having, you know, from having a negative correlation, so closer is better synchronization, to having a positive correlation that the uh, 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 further distances are correlated to better synchronization. Okay, okay, thank to you. Better, better information flow, sorry. Thank you. Right. Anyway, congrats again. Now we're just at the beginning of the story, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay, so now if we have late cameras, so now, now I'm starting with all the, with all the spoilers and the trick and tricks in the middle. Okay, so let's talk about the inter interpretable machine learning. So basically the question that we asked in this project is can we predict a cancer cell metastatic state uh, from live label-free uh, cell images? And uh, uh, we picked melanoma as a model and why, why melanoma is a very good uh, model to ask this question. It's because melanoma is characterized by huge genetic heterogeneity. There are many, many uh, mutations that are characterized with, uh, with melanoma. And eventually all of, these, uh, um, all of these mutations eventually lead to, the, to a similar cellular function of uh, causing uh, of, of cells that are invading and, and, uh, and surviving within the bloodstream and, uh, and, and, and getting gato and creating a remote metastasis. So in, in, in this type of systems, uh, genetics, at least we were, weren't able to use it uh, very helpfully to, to predict something about metastatic efficiency. So we were looking for more functional assay form to look what the cell is doing and how it looks like and try to correlate that to the cell state in terms of metastatic efficiency. So uh, we need functional readouts to stratify melanoma. And uh, first I'll tell you about uh, the systems that we used. So we used, we were very fortunate. This is my last postdoc project. Now, I'm talking about my last postdoc project. So I did my, I'm a computer scientist by training. Uh, I did my postdoc at the Gaudens Danuser lab at the UT Southwestern Medical Center. And I completed uh, this uh, manuscript now two years into my, <laughs> two years into my independent position. So, <laughs> So yeah, it, and it, it's a project that actually started in 2014, believe it or not. Uh, so we were very lucky to <laughs> we were very lucky to have access to, to, to this uh, fantastic uh, uh, model system uh, from the Morrison uh, lab uh, next door. Uh, what they did, they uh, took uh, a melanoma stage three. So these are metastatic melanoma from lymph nodes from patients, and then they xenographed them into mice. And then they correlated the outcome in the mice to the outcome in the patient. And this gave them a very powerful system to correlate uh, metastatic efficiency in a physiological uh, uh, relevant model. Uh, they kept correlating this uh, and, and they le learned a lot from it and it's, it's fantastic. Uh, it's a fantastic system. Uh, and uh, yeah, but, but the question that, that was still out there is whether we, we can predict whether this type of uh, metastatic uh, tu tumor that comes from a stage three melanoma will progress to stage four or not. So whether uh, the aggressiveness is defined by how, uh, how bad a metastasis is going to be, whether it's going to metastasize to lymph nodes and to the lungs or go further and spread all over the body. So this is how it's bad versus worse, right? 
so uh, these mice, uh, even uh, even through different passages, they are still uh, core, the, the, the outcome of the mice is, is is correlative to the outcome of the patient. So we can do this system uh, through many years. And uh, uh, what we did here is my uh, colleague Eric Wells was able, and it's also very hard to work with the uh, cells. They are not as easy as many of the cell lines. But then my colleague Eric Wells from the lab was able to uh, keep these cells uh, alive and happy from the mice and, uh, and uh, put them on a, a, a collagen, collagen gel substrate to, to at least have some of the, of the, to avoid some of the stiffness of the substrate in, on plastic. And basically we imaged them uh, with a, a face contrast microscopy and we just uh, stared at these images and it's kind of boring because the cells are not doing much. If you zoom in, you can see that they're actually, uh, mostly they're staying in place and mostly they're doing rapid blebbing, not the death blebbing, they're blebbing for hours like this and still uh, being uh, happy. Um, so when we checked all kinds of uh, measurements such as uh, motility and uh, morphology, uh, we weren't able to cell shape and stuff like that. We weren't able to discriminate between the high and low metastatic efficient cells. What we were hopeful about is, uh, is that the texture of these images could, could uh, encapsulate information that will allow us to make this distinguish, distinction between high and low metastatic efficient cells. And the uh, reasons that uh, led us also to be more optimistic about this approach is that uh, a few papers came out also that showed that bright field uh, images of cells contain information that allow to, to, to allow to also describe the molecular state of the cell. So where different uh, organelles are located and predict uh, a function of, uh, in, in different contexts. So what we did, we developed an uh, image analysis uh, pipeline. Uh, so we uh, detected and, uh, and tracked uh, single cells over the experiment. And from now on, this is going to be the atomic unit of information that I'm going to use. Images of uh, single melanoma cells uh, that are over time. Okay. And uh, as I told you, uh, direct feature extraction on, uh, on standard measurements based on shape and uh, dynamics uh, weren't able to, we, we weren't able to extract any discriminative information and uh, we turned into uh, uh, neural networks. So neural networks are, you know, all of us know that are very powerful techniques. Uh, they revolutionized the, the, a lot of, uh, many, many applications mostly in computer vision and in natural language processing and also in other domains. Uh, and basically what we use here is called an adversarial autoencoder. And basically it creates a compact representation of the cell appearance in an unsupervised manner. So let me, let me follow you through this network. This is the input image. This is the input of the network. Here we have an encoder which takes the image and compresses it into a low dimensional vector, in our case, a 56 dimensional vector, and that encapsulates the information about the appearance of this uh, cell. How do we know that it encapsulates the, the information about the appearance of the cell? Because we can take it and then use the decoder to create an image, a re reconstructed image, and the optimization of this network is by minimizing the discrepancy between the input image and the reconstructed image. So basically this network learn, learns a good representation of cell appearance in a completely unsupervised manner. The upper part here is the adversarial component and it's used for a re regularization, making the, the latent space a more uh, smooth. I, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so here is the, the training. Uh, you can see the reconstructed image coming from something very blurry to something that more resembles the cell. It's, still, it's not perfect. And actually having something that is better in, in recapitulating the exact details of the cell actually didn't help and actually were not as good as, as what, what I show you here. Uh, so we were able to train a network. And now what we can do, we can take the encoder and take an image 
and encode the image as, as a 56 dimensional uh, latent uh, the cell descriptor that uh, captures the appearance of the cell. So this is a completely unsupervised feature extraction. I mean, it is a network, but it is an unsupervised network. This representation doesn't encode any information. We didn't give it any information about, about the function of the cell, whether it's a high metastatic cell or a low metastatic cell, nothing. It's completely unsupervised, right? It's only optimized to capture the information within the, that, that resembles the, that, that encapsulates the cell appearance. So this is the encoder. And from now on, I'm going to talk about uh, these 56 uh, uh, numbers. And later we'll come to we'll come back to the decoder to the other part of the network. Okay, so this was an unsupervised representation of cell appearance, but from here we go and and go to a supervised setting uh, for classification, and uh, we basically we take the the latent vector, the feature representation of cell appearance, and now we can use it to ask uh, different questions, different classification questions. Uh, it has several advantages. One of them is that we can train our, uh, our network on, on all the data that we have. And then we can ask very specific questions on, on, on subsamples of the, of the data that, that is much uh, smaller and we cannot train a network on all of it. And also we do here a lot of rounds of uh, testing and training because we, do, we are very uh, careful about the statistical assessment. For example, when we want to see if, uh, if, if we, we can make prediction regarding metastatic efficiency, during the training, we never show our classifier anything about uh, the, 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 the patients that we're interested in predicting. And also we have here uh, also rounds of uh, training and testing without showing any information from the same day of the imaging because there are also day-to-day -day variability issues. So we want to be very careful about that. We have many, many trains of training and testing in order to validate our, our method. So this is the statistical analysis. And in principle, what we do, uh, let's say that each shape here is a different patient and uh, the orange are the high and the, uh, the cyan are the low metastatic efficient patients. Each time we can take one patient out as the test set, train, train a classifier, and here we use the LDA, just a standard uh, linear, linear disjointed analysis classifier uh, based on the training set and use a model on a patient that was never seen during training, right? This is very, very important, I think, to avoid overfitting. Okay, and here are our results on, not on the high versus low metastatic uh, efficiency question. I want to keep you a little more sus suspended, but on, on, on other questions. So we try to discriminate between cell lines and mel melanocytes, cell lines and clonal expansion of cells, or cell lines and PDXs. All of them are melanoma, of course. And what you can see here, you can see here three columns. On the left, you see an uh, area under the curve, area under the curve uh, uh, plot, which doesn't seem very impressive, right? This area under the curve of about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0. It depends on the application. Uh, what I want to highlight here that this is a, a this this is a, a rock uh, sorry this is the rock ROC curve right this is the rock curve for a single cell classification so this is the accuracy of classifying a single cell and given the huge heterogeneity within melanoma I think it's I think it's 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 fine I mean and given given that we have in one sample we have we are imaging many 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 cells we can actually make the prediction based on the consensus of many cells. And when we do that, we get, for example, here, perfect discrimination between cell lines and melanocytes or between uh, cell lines and PDXs, uh, and may, I think almost perfect between cell lines and clonal expansion cells. What you see on the right here is how good are we in classification when we take subsamples of 20 cells each time. So. Our, when we image 20 cells, how good can we make a dis discrimination between cell lines and melanocytes? Okay, and now for the holy grail, can we distinguish between high and low metastatic uh, patient, basically patients? The answer is yes. So we had uh, seven patients. Uh, for each of them, we trained the model based on the other six patients and we made the predictions and then uh, we can discriminate uh, perfectly based on this data. I know that seven is not a huge number. Here is what we can do with, but, but I'll try to convince you later that, uh, 
that it still it still uh, makes sense to believe that. Uh, 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 and here is what we can do with 20 cells. How good can we classify based on 20 cells? And we have much more in each imaging day, of course. Sorry, can I ask one quick question? Yeah, yeah go ahead. No, I'm just confused. So you have seven patients or, or seven cells now? No, no, seven patients. Right, okay. So, so you have, how, so in terms of here, the samples, it's much more samples. Yeah, yeah, we have many, many single cells per sample. And this right. is why from a very mediocre uh, ROC curve or area under the curve that is not approaching one, we can make a, a good prediction based on this, on, on this uh, cohort of uh, seven patients. We, we've I known see. the static efficiency, right? Right. And, and also another question uh, from a few slides before. So if I understand correctly, so you train the, the supervised training uh, on the low dimensional representation that you obtained with the auto encoder. Right, that's cool. But you, you already have the labels from the beginning, but you just don't use them. Yeah, I don't use the label and I use all the data in order to train an auto encoder. If you I think see. about it now, when you look at all these uh, huge uh, screening for, uh, cell profiling and screening projects that use uh, in, in networks, actually they also do that. So they use all their data set of whatever to train a network to have a very good representation of, uh, of a cell appearance. Yeah. And then they go into a supervised setting. Uh, one thing that is very powerful about that is exactly so melanocytes we have, we had very few, you know, we just didn't collect a lot of data from that. Uh, we could not train a neural network to do that. We just didn't have enough data for that, but mm -hmm. we can still still use the representation and, and, and make predictions based on the unsupervised encoding. And also if we'd have to do this train and testing uh, uh, cycles uh, using networks, we'll never finish this project. Right. I mean, I see. So that's interesting. Okay. So, so part of the, the part of the challenge was to get a good representation of the data, besides the labels and the supervised. Am I getting this right? I don't yeah. know if it was challenge. I mean, we just put all our data and it worked. I mean, we didn't do a careful analysis of how much data you need, and it was. 12,000 cells for, uh, you know, for long periods of time. So we had also the temporal information and we used also temporal information in some settings. I'm, I'm not going to get into that. I see. So we had see. millions of cells uh, to train this network. That's cool. Or All, cell right. All right, thanks, thanks. I'll let you go on. Okay. Uh, I need to check the time to see how much time. Okay, I'm fine. So uh, we did some, uh, and, and I'm, I'm taking the time because we're asking questions, so we don't need the discussion at the end, right? Is it okay or should I leave time for questions then? Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, I know that it's uh, technical, but I, I really, I was really, I was really happy to see that, that uh, the robustness of our approach. So we degraded the images in a very uh, different way. So with the Gaussian blur, you can see how bad the images after we, we blur them, always changing uh, illumination artificially within our images. And we can still, the area under the curve, we can still, we are above the random level very, very nicely. I mean, you see the decay that is very small, even from very uh, blurred images, which means that the method is uh, robust. Okay. And now I want to go to a, a validation that I hope will uh, convince you that, uh, that we have something uh, real here. Uh, when we look at the, I told you already that uh, we can discriminate between cell line and PDX. So again, each dot here is a different cell line. Many, many cells from a different, a specific melanoma cell line. And here, every dot is many, many cells from a specific uh, PDX. And we can discriminate between them. The question is, can we use the classifier that was trained on PDXs to make predictions regarding metastatic efficiency in cell line? Now, we know that they are very different, right? So, but, but, but they are very different in, in different aspects. Maybe what, the, 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 what was captured in the, the representation of the cells that the classifier is capturing, maybe the same, prop, the same cellular properties are encoded within the cell lines and maybe we can make predictions here. So what we did here, we did our, uh, what we call our live cell histology assay. So we image these cells 
uh, these uh, um, uh, cell lines, right? We have uh, six uh, known cell lines for melanoma. Uh, you see here different classifiers. Uh, so each we had the classifier for each patient, right? That they have never seen this patient, right? So we had several seven different classifiers, and we make made predictions regarding each of these cell lines. And we found that A375 is predicted to be a high met, and MVC had the lowest uh, score. Oh. And when we uh, made validation based on our prediction, we could find that uh, our prediction uh, worked. So A375 cells had remote, met all of them metastasized. I mean, all of them are highly metastasizing uh, uh, cell systems. This is why we, melanoma cell lines, this is why we pick them. Uh, but what you can see on the A375 is we have remote metastas metastasis all over the place. This was done by uh, Andres Navares from the lab. And uh, MV3 uh, cells did not uh, create remote metastasis. And here is the quantification. So all of them, most of them go to the lung, right? But when we looked at, at remote metastasis, we got, always we got remote metastasis with A375. And we didn't get that with the MV3 uh, with the MV3 uh, cell line. And, and this was also decoupled from the growth rate of the tumor. So you can see that the MV3, uh, uh, the tumor, the main, the primary tumor grow, grew much faster than the A375, although the A375 was much more aggressive. Okay, so I hope that uh, you are happy by now and, and convinced that this might work, right? This, this might be actually helpful in uh, diagnostics, maybe. And uh, basically what we do here, biopsy, transplantation in, in cells, culturing the cells, imaging them, using our uh, live cell histology and then correlating it uh, to what happens uh, uh, to the mice and to the uh, human, of course. And what we are thinking about maybe doing in collaboration now with the lab at the UT Southwestern is uh, taking a fresh biopsies and trying to see if it actually works, right? But this is a more industrial setting. But this is not enough. I mean, it's fine and it's fun that we can uh, make predictions regarding metastatic efficiency. But the question is, we, we want more, we need more. What, 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 what is going on here? What the network has captured? What cellular properties are actually uh, used by the classifier to make this prediction? We have no information. These networks are very powerful and they could do uh, things that uh, no uh, direct measurement uh, could extract, but we don't have any, any insight or any hypothesis or nothing about trying to understand what's going on here. So the first thing that uh, uh, we did, uh, we took cells and we ranked the, them based on the score of the classifier, based on what the classifier believed. And then we stared at, the, at these images and this is what we, we got. So blue is the, uh, low confidence score and the uh, red is uh, what the classifier thinks is really high metastasis. And then we stare at these images and I stare at thousands of them. And of course we cannot see anything. Why can't we see anything? Because there is the representation uh, of the, uh, the images. There is huge heterogeneity in, in the representation. And there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, characteristics of the image that do not relate whatsoever to the metastatic efficiency and can still cause variability within the images. So the classifier knows to focus on what is important, but the human eye cannot because there is a, a lot of other things that relate here to the variability between the cells. So what we thought of doing, it's a very, very naive and simple way to try to, to, to start to pick in and try to understand what's going on, is try to look feature by feature and try to see if we can correlate the value of each one of the 56 features to what the classifier thinks about these cells. So we have many, many, many single cells. We can encode them into 56 numbers. And now we can correlate each number here to the confidence score of the classifier on the same cell. And now we do that for many, many cells and we try to look at the correlations between each feature and the confidence score. And here is what we got. These are the correlations. Again, these are the features. These are the different classifiers. So we have seven different classifiers for each one for a different patient. And it's really hard to see here, but the, the, the striking correlation is in feature number 56. 
Uh, you can see a, a negative correlation of me, minus uh, 0 0.4 right here at the bottom. This is very, I mean, it's very, it's very different from what you see all over the place uh, anywhere else here. Uh, it's very extreme. So we thought that we were, I mean, we were lucky twice because we got one feature. I'll talk about it later. And uh, I don't know if it's lucky or not, but we, it was feature number 56, which, which actually made me the last feature, which actually made me very nervous about that. But after a lot of validation, this is, this is real. Uh, so here is another representation of, uh, of this, what happened in feature number 56, this magical feature, which is correlating with the, what the classifier thinks about the cell. What you see here, each dot is a cell, each color is a patient, and you can see the negative correlation between the patients and feature number 56. And when we look only at feature number 56, we can see that it's very nicely discriminated between the high and the low metastatic efficiency. Cells. Okay, but it still doesn't give us anything. Let's, let's stare at feature number 56. Let's see if this helps us to make a distinction and make some predictions. Okay, let's stare at these images. Low values are high metastatic now and high values are low metastatic. You remember it's a negative correlation. And of course we can still not see anything because the cell appearance is based on 56 numbers, 56 features. And now we're trying to to look only at one feature, which is might be very subtle and might be very subtle and might be masked or confounded by, by the information that are encoded in the other 50, 55 features. So this is the question. Well, what would we do now, right? So now, I mean, I'm a, I was trained in a computer vision lab. And one of the cool things that all of us like to do in this, uh, this uh, using this, uh, uh, auto encoders is the uh, morphing, right? Morphing faces or morphing whatever. And basically what we're going to do here is to morph cells, but to morph the cells in a very controlled manner and take the, the, the property and then we fix everything and we just change, we just tune the parameter. In this case, we have just one of them, feature number 56 and turn it really high and make a cell and then turn a cell from being a low metastatic to a high metastatic, again, in the eyes of the, of the classifier. So let's see what, how we do that. So we want to transform the cells in silico. We take a cell, we can shift feature number 56 from a low to a high or from a high to a low. And we can go, these are standard deviations. So we can go very high, something that you can never see in an experiment, a cell transitioning from a minus three standard deviation to three standard deviation in this feature. And then we can take this knob and turn it on. And then we can go back to the decoder. You remember that we have a, a, an autoencoder that have an encoding part and a decoding part. And then we can use the decoder to generate a fake image of a cell with the amplified, uh, hopefully with the amplified morphological features that is encoded in this feature number 56. So this is what we are going to do now. Take a cell, encode it, get a latent cell descriptor, change feature number 56 in a controlled manner while fixing all the rest of the variability within this cell, then use the decoder and then stare at an, at an image. So here is shifting a cell again in the, in the a decoded cell, right? A reconstructed cell from a low to a high or from a, a high to a low. And when we try to understand what we now see in this transition, what we see here are two things. So this is feature number 56, and this is going to turn it to high values, which means a low metastatic efficiency, or turning it to low values, which means a high metastatic efficiency in the eyes of the classifier. And you can see that here, that the classifier thinks that it goes to high metastatic efficiency or low metastatic efficiency. And here we're looking at the differences, at the positive differences from the Basel state from uh, you know the reconstruct the the the, reco the images we started with the reconstructed images we started with, and what you can see very clearly is that we see that the light scattering is increasing. We can see something much more bright here, and we can see those also mini protrusions that uh, come out and that we can we cannot see them here. So from this, we hypothesis that feature number fifty six is associated with a combination, and again, it's one feature, 
but it can encapsulate in it multiple uh, uh, phenotypes, multiple uh, 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 morphological features of the cell, right? So we think that it, it, it captures, or we try to show that it captures protrusive activity and increased uh, light scattering. So here are some validations. First, uh, the, the, did we cherry pick a cell or is it replicated? It's replicated. I mean, we can look at many cells and do the same trick and show that it always works. Is it specific? Yes, it is specific. We can look at all the features, 56 features, and we can turn them up and down. And you can see here first, the, cl the classifier is very convinced by feature number 56. And also you can see that the cells are turning from low to high and having these much more brighter, uh, brighter uh, images in the bright field. And uh, that you can see here in the D plus uh, measure. Uh, yeah, so basically it is uh, uh, replicated and it is specific. And now uh, for the question that I, I actually answered that, but you, you probably all I asked. I mean, just one feature, I mean, what's going on? Uh, feature number 56, uh, what, 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 is, it, is it always the case? The answer, of course not. We were super lucky here with this one feature. Just for example, here is, here's the same trick, the same looking at correlation, for a different task, for discriminating between cell lines and uh, PDXs. And what you can see here in the correlation, you can see that there are correlations here in feature number, I don't know, 27 and 30 something. And there, it's much more of a mess here when we try to find what are the discriminative features between uh, a cell line and a, a PDX. Uh, and now we're working, I mean, but if you think about it, the, the, the generalization is not that, I mean, we didn't go there because we were lucky and the more uh, exciting, uh, uh, a physiologically relevant uh, question, the most exciting application was we were lucky with one feature, but now we're going into multiple feature for other applications. And, uh, and basically it's not very hard. I mean, basically you want to, to go on the gradient of the, of your uh, classifier. You just want to go in the gradient of the classifier to maximize that, and you can do the same trick in a high dimensional space. Okay, so now after, and now I'm going back to feature number 56. After uh, we did all of these uh, uh, validations in silico, we're still not convinced because we want to see something, uh, something real. We don't want to, to generate fake images and make all our decisions based on, based on that. But the thing is that now, when we know exactly what to look for, right? We can, we can actually look for one cell that is spontaneously transitioning in the eyes of the classifier, not for real, but in the eyes of the classifier from a low to a high or from a high to a low. And then we can focus, focus and, and look specifically for the properties that we think are, the, are describing the high versus low metastatic efficiency, basically this light scattering and this uh, protrusion. So here is a cell that in a time of uh, 10 minutes is, uh, is uh, switching from a, a, a confidence score that, is, uh, that uh, correlates with a, a low metastatic efficiency to a confidence score that is correlating to a, the, 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 the classifier things is a high metastatic efficiency. It's one cell, it's live image, right? And now when we can look at the cell and we look what happens during these uh, 10 minutes, we can see very clearly the light scattering phenotype feature number 56, the light uh, uh, phenotype. I mean, protrusions we cannot really see. I mean, we can see that there are protrusions. We cannot see, you can see the, the, the small protrusions that are different than what, 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 what was in, uh, in uh, time zero, but I don't think it's uh, super convincing, but uh, we think that this is, this is something that you cannot get with live imaging. We, can, we think that this, this is something that exactly what, so if you ask, why don't you just measure protrusions, the reason is that you cannot, measuring the protrusions will not make the trick. I mean, you need to, to amplify that in order to see that, in order to make the predictions. That we, so this we, we cannot validate uh, with live imaging and we make this prediction based on the in, the in silico exaggeration of the phenotype. But light scattering is it's very clear that it, it's here. So here is the cell transitioning uh, in the wild and we have a few more of these, but not too many because we're looking exactly for something that is very rare a cell that is transi transitioning from a low to a high in the eyes of the classifier. 
Okay, so I'll, uh, I think I'm about to finish. Uh, metastatic efficiency is associated with a combination of enhanced protrusive activity and increased light scattering. Increased light scattering can come from many, many reasons. And we, we, frankly, we don't have an idea at this stage what exactly is it that is uh, correlating with uh, the metastatic efficiency. And hopefully, uh, I'll, we'll continue working on that uh, with the UT Southwestern Lab and uh, figure this out at some point. Uh, so I think that the summary, okay, we can discriminate high versus low, but what more excites me is the ability to interpret what we find and to make actually make a hypothesis and make predictions, functional predictions, uh, based on this idea of finding what is important for the classifier to make a decision and then amplifying it in silico and then coming with an, an, a specific hypothesis. So these are the people who, who were uh, who led this uh, project together with me. Andrew was uh, joined me when I left the lab, and he, he did uh, a lot in the computational aspects. Andrew did uh, frankly all of the experiments and the uh, mice experiments. Uh, Eric established the experimental system, and the uh, Gaudens was uh, all of us. Uh, all of our he was the mentor of all of us. And uh, there is a preprint up in the bioarchive, and uh, we're now now dealing with uh, revisions. With uh, right, <laughs> we're now uh, answering uh, our reviewers. Uh, I just want to say that now in my own lab, we're trying to do similar ideas to apply similar ideas to to different aspects. Um, we have uh, two projects that uh, use that. One of them, which I'm I'm showing here, and I'm not going to talk about, but I'm showing here is is in uh, the context of uh, IVF, in vitro fertilization. Uh, basically, we're trying to generate uh, virtual embryos uh, and try to use similar ideas to what we did in the melanoma to, to, to predict whether an embryo is going to, to a, a human embryo, right? That is imaged in, in, in uh, that is live imaged, whether it's going to produce a healthy uh, baby eventually or, or not in, in early, in early in early times, and this is in collaboration with a company called the AABF. And Daniela here is the is the founder and the CEO. Uh, I'll finish the talk with my last uh, slide. Oh, okay. So, come on. Yes, yeah, so I'll go back to. Uh, yeah, I'll go back to, 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 to my, the beginning of my talk. Uh, I, I showed you here two example where we switched the order. There is no way that we can look at the melanoma cells and make predictions. There is no way I can look at this fluctuating uh, calcium signaling and make any decision about leader cells, follower cells, communication, have now information propagating the network. The only way to answer this question is to go first measure stuff. I mean, you need to know what you measure, but first measure, and then, especially in the melanoma project, go back to the biology and try to understand uh, what we measured and what we can learn from that. So that's it, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions open? I actually have another one. Uh, if no one else... Uh... All right. So, so uh, thanks very much for it was it was amazing. I liked it very much. Uh, so I was thinking. So now that you you found the magic feature, right, N number fifty six. Uh, so maybe could, couldn't you think of a, of a simpler filter or, or signal filter, something simpler that captures? Because now you know it's something related to light scattering or something like that. Uh, because I guess it's kind of heavy to carry around this, you know, autoencoder and yeah, is that something you, you've been thinking of, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, light scattering is easy. I mean, light scattering, we could just measure that and make and see how good it is at SA reader, right? We, actually, we didn't do it. It's a good idea to try it, but we're probably not going to do it because the reviewers didn't ask for it. Uh, <laughs> but but right. it's a good idea to test to see how good, how good, how, how well does it work, right? Uh, uh, protrusions, we know that it doesn't work. I mean, no way. Hmm. Uh, 
Yeah. So. I see. Yeah. And but yeah, I, I think it's. I mean, to continue this project, I would go uh, either either going into the clinical aspect and trying to see, you know, going into more industrial setting and trying to do to do it in high throughput and many patients and etc. And see if it's it's if it's real real right or just for n equals seven plus the, the two cell lines, hmm. uh, or, or going into, or and going into and trying to understand what is this slight scattering phenotype, or, so we know that, the, the, actually we know that the, from, from work in Gaudens' lab and in other labs now, that the, this type of protrusions are actually have uh, signals that they relate to, to, uh, to survival, actually. So, other other idea is to try to inhibit that and see how they relate to metastatic efficiency and to what the classifier thinks about these uh, these live cell histology cells after you inhibit uh, the protrusion. Thanks. Thanks very much. All right. The comment from Andrew Odero. He said, uh, "I'm not an expert in these areas, but I like to listen to get ideas on the application of artificial intelligence." So thanks uh, to the presenter. So thanks to you. Um, yeah. Other questions? I have a little comment. So, I mean, uh, the cell lines that you used, uh, it's okay, but I don't know if I would like to see maybe the same patients, no? Same, there are cell lines that you can get uh, with the, uh, obtained from the same patients at different stage. So, I mean, uh, you starting from the beginning, the primary, and then you get the metastasis. I'm sure that is fine. It's perfect. I love these uh, ideas and it's great, but just, uh, Literal max. And on the other hand, I was thinking, okay, but in the real life, I know melanoma, there are many stages and there are a, a complex system. It's still a complex system because you don't have only melanoma cells, but you have an environment that's quite complicated. No? Uh, did you think about this? I don't know. You have any ideas? You want to go in this direction, maybe eco cultures or something like this? So, so in, the, in the context, so, okay, so now there are two, again, two arms here, right? In the context of the live cell histology, I think we focus at the single cell level on purpose, right? We wanted to see if cell shape is a predictor in single cells, no other context whatsoever. And there we are, we're not going to look at, I mean, we can change the microenvironment, but we're still going to use the readout as the single cell uh, appearance and behavior, right? In the context of collective behavior, yes, definitely. Uh, I just submitted the proposal now with uh, Ayelet Lesman from Tel Aviv University and another cancer cell biologist in Ben Gurion University named uh, Michelle Cabet. When we propose to see whether the mechanical interaction, uh, communication, right, that we measure through the substrate from a, 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 a tumor cells and the microenvironment cells, right, the fibroblast and the, the endothelial, right, I mean, whether, whether these are a functional readout for uh, eventually aggressiveness in, in metastasis, yeah. Thanks a lot. Other questions? Okay, do you have questions? Oh. I'm asking. Yeah. I think uh, we are all set. I want to really thank so much the two speakers, Asaf and Francisco to be with us. And it was a great discussion, I think. Uh, the record is on YouTube if you want to watch again. Uh, okay, thank you so much. And uh, we will see uh, if you want uh, in October, 5th of, October, 5th of October, we will have the next uh, seminars. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.